appears to you what the Spirit is saying to the church, not what tradition, denomination, or the echo of what men have said. Let us not be idolaters stuck on pet doctrines, but help us to be true to truth. Feed us and we will be changed. Feed us and we will be changed. There is a famine in the land. It is not for the preaching of your word. It is for the hearing of your word. Let this house not be caught anorexic, but let them be such hearers that they will be fat at the table of the Lord, eating the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. We bless you. 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 Come on, worship the Lord. Come on, worship him. Just a few more seconds. Don't applause them. Don't applause. Applause is not worship. Worship. You don't clap. When your wife says, come here and give me a kiss, you don't clap your hands. Come on, love him. Kiss him. Say something to him. Worship is intimacy. It, it is an interaction. It is an interaction. Come on, come on, worship him, worship him. We bless you. We love your Lamb of God. We love your Lamb of God. Thank you, sir. We love your Lamb of God. We love you, Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Um, I'm a, it's a blessing to be here. Let me apologize for being so late. I'm, uh, I'm on several different medications. And uh, ever since we've been fighting with colon cancer and things. And I try not to take one before I preach. But this morning I forgot it. And then I was asleep in the presence of the Lord. I was laying before him. And <laughs> when they came to get me. And so... Uh, I, let me apologize it wasn't intentional you know but um, any opportunity to worship see in my mind worship is not preliminaries we could go home because you can't take an hour and talk to God and God not talk back to you and so there's something incredible when we are in his presence like that and somebody once told me said uh, they introduced me and said now it's time for the most important part of the word which is the preaching of the gospel and the Holy Spirit checked my spirit when I got up. I said, it's not. That's incorrect. The preaching of the gospel is not the most important part of the service. The preaching of the gospel is the secondary consequence of man's sin and disobedience. We must preach today because we don't act right yesterday. But worship was the command of God in the garden before man ever messed up. And so if man didn't mess up, he'd still have to worship. Westminster Catechism, which is the catechism read, written in England in the 16th century, dealing with the uh, Protestant Reformation that was taking place there. The first question that is asked in the catechism, catechism is the Greek word katekeia, catechism, to teach by question and answer. Those of you that used to be Catholics remember the Baltimore Catechism, you know, where is God? God is everywhere, you know, all these things. But, and so the chief question of the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, to worship God and to enjoy him I like that part to enjoy him all the days of our lives and so there is a quest that we are on to enjoy him we don't get saved to be miserable we don't get saved to come in here and just be saved enough to get to heaven and saved enough to stay out of hell there is something that we are in pursuit of something far greater than that and that is the presence of the Lord in our life something that we can that is not only imaginary but tangible and so uh, I'm just glad to be here a house that worships the moment I walked in last night I could tell that there was a sincerity in the house and there's a passion for the things of God it's one thing to sing good it's another thing to sing love songs and because you love him and so um, there's, there's, a, there's a spirit in this house that is requisite for the move of God. And there's a certain type of house that God looks for. He just doesn't show up anywhere. He looks for a place that's welcoming. He looks for a place where Mary sits at his feet. There's a whole lot of places that have Martha cleaning the kitchen. But there are a few places that have Mary when I heard the story about Mary and Martha, it disturbed me because I don't understand why God in the person of Christ would 
almost glorify such extravagant waste and laziness doesn't make sense to me not in my view of the kingdom in the kingdom we have too many lazy people we need more people to be doing things and so but I understand that the issue was cleaning Martha was trying to clean because she wanted to make a good impression on Jesus and Mary understood that Jesus is the one person you can't impress because it doesn't matter how much you clean he's gonna see the dirt in the corner nobody else sees and so Mary said instead of spending an hour trying to just make stuff look pretty I'm just gonna sit at his feet because when he cleans you you're clean And when we listen to his word, his word will find things in us that we can't fix up. We can fix it up. We can put a long dress on anybody. A long dress and a long face and a, you know, a suit and a tie and, and, and fake it and make it and act like we got it together. But the reality is, is that those that are really hungry for God every day sit in his presence, sit at his feet and say, here I am, right, wrong, or indifferent. All my strengths, all my weaknesses, cleanse me, change me, bless you guys. Good to see you. And we hunger for his presence. I was preaching in the biggest churches in the country, all over the world. Booked for TBN. I just said, signed a three-year contract. And something broke in me. I signed it. I remember getting on the plane. We signed the contract. We talked about the salaries, everything. The numbers were incredible. And something broke in me. And God said, this is not... What I called you to. This is not what I told you to do. Go back, Veron, and find your first love. We're going to talk today about, I want to talk about fivefold ministry, but we also want to talk about apostolic ministry in particular and what that really means because when we hear the word uh, apostolic, the first thing we, we identify it with oftentimes is doctrinal movements. But it is not. It's not that. It's far more important than that. You cannot be an apostolic church if there are not apostolic voices in the community that are bringing order. And when we begin to understand that, God begins to speak to me. He said, get, get, get your first love again, Ron. Get your first love. Get back to that place. Understand why I've called you to do what you do. This is the thing that, 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 that amazes me in the church. How many of us have lost our love? For the things of God, they're, they're, our, our, our passion, our, there was something innocent. I, I don't know about you, but when I first came into the church, you all may not, may not have had this type of experience, but when service was over, it wasn't over. You remember the, there would be people praying at the altar and the deacons were turning off the lights and they, the families had to get them off the altar and pick them up slobbering and boogers hanging out their nose and hair and and put them in the car and in the car they still speaking in tongues and times had to pull the car over because the presence of God came in there there was something innocent and about it but there was something pure and passionate that the presence of God met us and found us any place I realized at the time that I had preached in most of the mega churches in this country by this time I was invited to most of them I had spoken all over the world I would prophesy to pastors and to leaders and to people my gift would operate my in the house of the Lord but I forgot that when I was a young guy running revivals at small churches and traveling, you know, and catching planes and being there and going to eat at Pizza Hut, that the word of the Lord would come on me when I was sitting anywhere. You couldn't eat, you couldn't go have breakfast with me and me not prophesy over cornflakes. I never forget we were in, I was in LA and we went to a pizza place and while I'm in the pizza place and I remember the guy that was with me used to travel with me sometimes I was young I was 21 22 years old at this time and the guy's making the pizza and I'm staring I'm staring and the guy that's with me said please not here come on dog let him finish the pizza don't let him come on man I'm hungry you know and the word of the Lord you know and it's coming on me and I say hey you he looks up his hair all in the little things so you don't get down on you know on the pizza and stuff and I spoke to him, I spoke to him, and I said, I said, I said, your brother was killed by a bullet. He was a gangbanger. You lost your faith in God. You haven't been home in two years. 
your mother doesn't know what happened to you. But by this time, he's snotting and crying all on our pepperonis and stuff. We had to go to Burger King after that, but there was a passion. There was, there was something about God that didn't need church buildings. Something about him that I could pull on him anywhere. And when I became so good at ministry, I began to neglect his presence in everyday life. What God has done for me in the last several years, after losing everything, diagnosed with cancer, dealing with ulcerative colitis, megatoxic colon every day of my life now, sleeping on the floor, being homeless in a park with nothing, after having everything, this is what I have found out. I have found God in ordinary things. The natural has become supernatural. I have found his presence in the most unique place. He has spoken to me through people and things I never would have listened for him before. True apostolic ministry is the foundation of the church. God says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates in this era or in that era that it's written, are not offensive weapons. Gates are not there to keep or to attack you. You never walked by a gate and the gate jumped up and attacked you. Gates are there to keep you out. The gates of hell will not prevail. There is an apostolic voice. There is a group of people now that are going to so hunger for God that they're not going to wait for the enemy to come to them. They're going to come to him. Revival has to leave walls. The outpouring of the spirit has to find its place in areas it would have never seen itself before. And as long as we are stuck on our subculture, we will never really experience the presence of God. Let me tell you something. People are not going to listen to you when you walk up and the first words out of your mouth are praise the Lord. Because they're an unbeliever. Praise the Lord is a command that does not apply to them in the immediate sense. Let everything that have breath praises the Lord. It is their very breath that testifies because the Hebrew word is Kaddish, uh, which means holy ruha rather, which means spirit, spirit, and, 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 and breath are synonymous. So in that sense, the Jew understands that if you're breathing, you're praising. But to say praise the Lord, what is that? That doesn't recognize anything to them. You have to be able to meet them where they are, understand what they're dealing with and then let the gospel not be a series of remembered thoughts ideas colloquialisms and fancy things but let it be a true expression of his presence see the bible says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets the apostles and prophets paul says to the church of corinth says that i send apostles first apostles the word greek there uh, the greek word for first is Proton. Proton means first in order of preeminence. It doesn't mean that the apostle is more important than the prophet. It doesn't mean that the prophet is more important than the pastor. What happens in the church is we take secular ideas and try to understand or interpret biblical concepts. And so we think that because the apostle is first, he is more important than. And then, so now everybody is an apostle. You know, everybody. And we're not understanding that what that means is the apostle. That's why, really, the word apostle is translated missionary. The apostle goes where nobody else wants to go. Now, the problem is that most people we have called missionaries were not apostolic. And so they came into regions to fight demonic powers, but did not have the apostolic authority to really do it. And so by what they did is they set up Bible studies. But we never saw revival. Are you with me? Watch now. When an, ap an apostle doesn't have to leave his city to go someplace nobody's been before, he can begin to declare a truth that has never been declared. He can speak to the Spirit and begin to prophesy. And when, when you have a church that's committed to apostolic ministry, you can begin to change the spirit of the region and be missionaries in your own community because you go first. Sometimes you can be connected to a tradition or to a, a group of people. And because you break, even though you're still connected to them, but you break out of the tradition 
and begin to move into the things of the Spirit in a way or a region that they haven't went, now you're operating apostolic. Because you're moving into something that other men were afraid to move in because you are declaring something that they were afraid to declare because they would lose the popularity of their brethren. But the price you will pay for truth is oftentimes the friendships that you have built close to you. And so the apostles and prophets, the foundation of the church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets. The foundation of the church, the Bible says in the last days, there shall come creatures, the like of which have never been seen before, and they shall come out of the bottomless pit. Can I prophesy to you that a church that is not built on apostolic and prophetic ministry is a bottomless pit? And there are creatures, there are preachers that come out of it. They have the face of men, but the Bible says they have the bodies of animals, and there is a sting. It won't kill you, but it will make you sick unto death there are preachers coming out of the bottomless pit that are preaching messages that are not going to kill us necessarily but they will fill us with such religion and disgusting traditions that we miss the passion they sting us and move us away from god and this time we're living in we are seeing this this expression we're seeing this and so when we understand that God connects us to men that are bringing foundational teaching. Now understand this, the foundation, foundational teaching is not always given great what's what I'm looking, accolades. When apostles go in, they pioneer. When a person moves into an apostolic anointing, when you move into uh, an apostolic community and God tells you to do something in a region that has not been done before. God tells you to produce a people, to produce something that is filled with passion for God. When you commit to that, it's not easy. We're talking about paving the way, pioneering. An apostolic anointing is a pioneering anointing. It will, it will and it will not be understood because the first thing the apostle is going to do is bring order. And let me tell you something, if you don't believe this, just keep living. The biggest problem that we have is with apostolic order. Because people connected to an apostolic house, we're not talking about denomination, we're talking about people that are committed to those that have heard the, the message of the kingdom and are declaring it. John the Baptist, let me tell you something about apostolic voices. John the Baptist was in the wilderness. And the Bible says he was saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Repent. Prepare the way of the Lord. He was in the wilderness. And the Bible says he was in the wilderness alone and declared, repent for the kingdom of heaven is in hand. And the Bible says that the multitudes came. He was there by himself. He was preaching to cactus. But the message began to go through the airwaves and people in the city didn't even know and said let's just take a let's go have a picnic when an apostolic church is in position it will begin to influence the radio the television it will begin the economy the schools when you begin to declare truth the declaration of truth will change the spiritual character of the region that is in it doesn't need tracks. It doesn't need something to put in somebody's hand. All it needs is the word, the word. This is why it is that the Bible says through the foolishness of preaching. And it is not just any kind of preaching. When Paul said that it is the foolishness of preaching, he was referring to his preaching, which is apostolic preaching. He, Paul understood it is through this foolish preaching. And what makes it foolish is, is that it is a weak idea it doesn't come with publicity it doesn't come with the things that we like to do we, we immediately one, one of the things when i began to preach for all of these men i never forget one of the the largest ministry in this country sat me down and said look the first thing you have to do is you you need to hire a publicist and i said well where is that in the bible he says you need a publicist because so if there's any controversy or anything they can clean it up for you they can straighten it up or or they can get you into the TV shows. You can get you on the radio, get you on the, 
newscast. You're, you're unique. You're, you know, all of these different things. You're prolific in the, in the languages and educated. You can go far. And we need to, so we need to find you one of the best. He says, the one that I hired when I had 500 members and wrote my first book and started to do a few conferences. He said, the one that I hired, I hired from Wall Street. She cost me close to $200,000. He said, but everything that you see, this woman made happen. So you need to do this. And all I could hear is, it is through the foolishness. The foolishness, calculated ideas. Not ideologies that will work in a secular world, but something that succeeds at the expense of secular success. Something that seek, succeeds in spite of itself. Do you, do you understand? Do you understand that that's what the gospel, it succeeds in spite of itself. That, that, that what we declare, the word changes. It doesn't need demographics. It doesn't need, it doesn't need any other. It is the word of the Lord. Now that's not to say that we will not use whatever resources are available to us, but we will never forget that our first call is the declaration of truth. The problem with declaring truth is that it is unyielding. Truth is unyielding, therefore it's unpopular. Truth is absolute. So you must meet it where it is. cannot come to you. It will never find you. Seek. And you, do, do, you're not getting it. Truth will never find you. Because truth is not looking for you. Because truth is absolute. Yes, sir. And so, when apostolic ministries come, they don't look for the numbers. They're not trying to have the next church with 10,000 people. The apostle says, give me 200 that are hungry for truth. Not doctrine. And when I say truth, I'm not talking about theology or doctrine. Because anything, let me say this to you. And you don't have to like it because I got a round trip ticket before I got here and it's paid for. And, I, and at least I know which way is west. I can walk home if that don't work. But look. Anything that produces pride or arrogance is not truth. I don't care. Anything that makes you think that you're better than anybody else or more spiritual or better or have a better doctrine or we're saved and you ain't or, or we're more spiritual because we don't look like you or you don't look like you, whatever that is, that's not truth. Because truth is so absolute that whenever you stand in his presence, whatever you know, you cast it aside. When the elders in heaven stand before God and the Bible says that he rewards them and gives them crowns for the work that they've done. The Bible says they take their crowns and throw it at his feet because they realize when they stand in the presence of the king that nothing that they did was worthy of standing in his presence. Nothing. Not one sermon, not one evangelism, not one person they baptized. None of it is worthy to stand in the presence of the king. Paul says that our righteousness becomes... Like filthy rags, the word there literally is toilet rags, rags that are used to clean human fecal matter from themselves. It is the most disgusting term that a man could use. And Paul says, all that we have accomplished in the presence of the king, hear me, in the presence of the king, we are broken and humbled. I said this to the apostle today, we were talking to this bishop, and I'm going to declare the word of the Lord because I believe that this house... And the people that are called to it, and people that are here today are not here by accident. I don't believe in accidents or coincidences. I believe that there's something in you that's hungry. You don't, some of you don't even know why you're here. You don't even know what God's doing, but you know that God's doing something. The Bible says that, 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 that Moses was the greatest of all men to have lived because he was the lawgiver. It was through Moses that the Torah came, the five books of the scripture, of the Bible. And so the giving of Torah was the revelation of God's light among his people, the Jews. So Moses is considered the greatest prophet of all prophets because he taught men how to find God. 
Now watch. The Bible says that Moses was the meekest of all men in the world. Exodus says that of Moses, he was the meekest, which means gentle humility. Hear me. There's a direct connection. There's a direct connection between humility and the anointing. You want to know how valid an anointing is? Find out how humble a person is. Because you cannot see that. You cannot walk out of his presence. One of the, one of the most disturbing things for me has been. And I told God, I said, let me always be like this. Is that whenever I have experienced the move of God. Truly experienced his presence. Truly experienced it. I want you to know that I, I walked out. Of church broken because to be in his presence and see God do things made me miserable because I knew of all men I'm not worthy see do you understand that I would walk out and I would say oh my god you spoke you healed you did this 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 and this and why through me of all the people in the world your pre and the only true place you can, you can, the only place after being in his presence is a broken place. You give me a hundred men that are broken, and I'll show you a revival greater than what took place a hundred years ago here. Real brokenness. Not religious tears at an altar that are subsequent to a sermon that plays emotional games with us and manipulates us to get a great altar call, but really has not challenged us to change our life. Preachers are the best at manipulating emotions so that we can say, brother, we had a great altar call and get you there. But here doesn't matter if when you get up from there, you're not changed when you walk out of there. It, I, I don't care if you never fall on your knees here. But if you go home and you think, and a wife goes home to an unsaved husband who has not come to church in 15 years, and she cooks him dinner, she stays home and she hugs him when he comes in from work and she says, I have failed. I've been so faithful to the church and so committed to the things there that I haven't been a good wife. And now I know why you wouldn't go to church. I wouldn't go to church with somebody like me. Tell me what you need for me to be a better wife so that you can see the light of Christ through me so that you'll want to come. The Bible says a sanctified wife sanctifies the husband. Not more religious, not praying louder, not sprinkling oil on his pillow. <laughs> not sitting there every time he opens up a beer and saying, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> you know, the word, no. It says, oh my. But understands. See, this is what I'm talking about. When you begin to experience apostolic, apostolic ministry will challenge you in places that's never challenged you before. It will challenge you to be what God has called you to be, not in the sense of ministry. The danger of this generation is that everybody lusts for the pulpit. Yes, sir. It is amazing to me. People are not saved 15 minutes and God called them to preach. Immediately they lust for that. And if they don't get it, they start their own. Because we have glorified here. Let me tell you something. I've been there. I've been at the biggest one. This is the thing I said. I told one young guy. He came to me. He says, man. He says, uh, I can't wait for God to open up doors for me like he opened up for you. I said, you're crazy. Yeah. And if you ain't, you will be. Yeah. Because this, this is minimal. This is not ministry. This is simply a regurgitation of things that we have experienced all week. It's, it, it, it's, this, is not, this is not the price. The price is not paid. You cannot determine the validity of a man's ministry by the hour and a half that he pours out of his mouth what he's read from somebody else's book or heard from somebody else's sermon. It is the power that is filled with his life, not necessarily always demonstrated through the sick being healed and the bound being delivered. It is a subtle 
power. It is a power that you cannot put on the front page of a magazine or put on TBN. It is a power that will never be seen by television cameras. It is a power to seek God and do violence to the most powerful enemy he will ever encounter himself. This, listen to me. I never understood this, but when I read the verse, it said, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I asked God, I said, God, what does this mean? Are we supposed to take the radio stations and take the TV stations and take, the, kind of take it by force? That's what we do. We think it's that. We take it by force. No, no, no. The kingdom of God. Where is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? He says it is neither here nor there. It's not with observation. If you can see it, if you can say it's there, guess what? It's not the kingdom. Do you understand it? Oh, my God. Lee Stone King is running revival at this church. The kingdom is there. No. Because if you can say it's there, it's not the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not with observation. It is secret. It is subtle. It's hidden. It's in you. The kingdom of God allows violence. And only the violent take it. By force. Men and women who are willing to do violence to their comfort zones. Not to war with other religions or war with the other states or other things. But to war with Paul said that there is a fight. I fight. And it's here. Here. You get it? You want to do violence? Do violence to yourself. The kingdom of God. True declarations of the kingdom will cause you. To have to sacrifice things that you never thought were valuable. It will inconvenience you on every level. It will call you to dimensions in God that you will never be able to get invited anywhere for. The true expression of God's kingdom will never open a door. It will never print a, 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 a flyer. There will be no business cards. When it begins to express itself, it will be sold down. And it, because let me tell you something. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. True warfare takes place in areas and, and in places that most men never see. When I move into a city, when I come into a city apostolically to declare the word of the Lord, and I know I'm going into that city, let me tell you something. The Bible says apostles go first. That means in order of preeminence, an apostle is first, right? When I go into a city, I know that I'm going to deal with the prince demons because I'm a prince in the church. And my job is to battle those spirits. Now, how do I battle them? I have to discern the spirit of ignorance because how does the devil fight? He blinds our eyes. The Bible says the princess of this world has blinded our eyes. So what he does is he keeps us ignorant. The greatest weapon of the enemy is ignorance. The greatest procurer of the greatest weapon of the enemy is the church. We dumb you down. Just get saved. That's all. No, 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 no. You can't fight demons with just being saved. You have to fight the spirit of England. And so when we go to war, when I do violences to myself, watch. When we do violences to ourselves. First, uh, or Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Turn there. I want to show you this. Because I want to talk. If, if I do violence to myself, when, when I truly pursue the things of God, when you truly pursue God, when you truly pursue God, most of your greatest experiences will happen by yourself. Somebody told me, said one time, he said, my God, Bishop, when you preach or whatever, I heard this message. How did you, what, what, how do you get a good sermon? How do you develop a good sermon? I said, well, I don't know. I don't know how to develop a good sermon. By the time I'm preaching, that hour, two hours that I preach, whatever, I was a two-year conversation with God. In my prayer closet. If you think the sermon was good, you should have heard that argument. You think that, 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 that what I'm describing there is incredible. You should see what I experienced in the private recesses of my home and my faith and my passion for God. True hunger for God. I have had men that swore up and down on me. They would tell you that I was the best thing to slice bread. These men were covenant, called themselves sons. 
And at the first sign of any controversy, or the first sign of something they didn't agree with, and I'm telling you, every son that called themselves sons in ministry that were connected to me and wrote me checks, thousands and thousands of dollars, every one of them left because they wanted titles and positions. And God said, you ain't ready. Amazing. Amazing how those words will reveal the Antichrist. You know what the Antichrist is? He's a multi-headed spirit that comes out of a religious system. The Antichrist is an I, John, saw a creature rising up out of the sea, out of the group of people. Had seven heads and ten horns. We know that there's a different meanings for it, but one of the things that is seven heads, anything that has more than one head is Antichrist. <laughs> The moment there are people that are in your community, listen, listen to me, I don't care how anointed you are, I don't care how many people you have prayer meetings for and they get healed and sick, you'll never be above your leader. Never. And that has nothing to do with pride. It doesn't even have to say that he's better or more anointed. Or less. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean. It means that God sets people in the church. See, everybody needs someone to submit to. Hear me. Because it is a natural consequence of the anointing to produce pride. You cannot experience this. You need some place that somebody is not going to... A prophet is without honor in his own land. Do you know why? Because in his own home, they don't see the prophet. They see little Johnny, who's hard-headed, who broke into the store and stole candy. Who They see little Johnny, who, who fell in love with a little girl, and she didn't like him, and he was there crying on the stone corner. You know, all of a sudden, his whole world falling apart. They know all of it. They saw little Johnny, who... Who ate too many beans and then, you know, passed gas at the table and looked like a fool. They know him as a human. See, every prophet needs somewhere to come home to where they don't see the man of God. They see someone that needs to be seeking God like they seek him. It keeps us humble. The funny thing is we like to surround ourselves with people that pat us on the back and tell us how wonderful we are. But we need to surround ourselves with people that don't know the apostle and the prophet but want to know him together. We need men. I don't look for a church to submit to that's going to get me the anointing. The anointing is going to come by my passion for God. I need a church to submit to that's going to keep me humble in the presence of God. A place that I can come home to and not be the apostle. I was killing myself, man. You know why? Because I had no place that I wasn't the bishop. No place. I had my, my real friends that I was in covenant with moved back to Paris. Went back to France, Montpellier. And so they were incredible, both Harvard graduates. They, they clocked me. They called me. They called me on anything. They were my friends. And when they left, I didn't have any other healthy friendships, especially in the church, because the people in the church are just all, you know, Google eyed. And they, they all come with agendas. Those that say, God, God sent me to serve you were actually there to steal from me or were trying to use my ministry to open doors for their ministry. While I'm preaching in the church, they're asking the pastor for a business card so that when we leave, they can call him and try to book themselves. But these, are, but these people were such friends and it was great because I would come home from traveling all, you know, month and stuff like that. And they call and say, what do you do? I said, nothing. I said, let's go eat. All right. And I knew. I put on my jeans and my t-shirt, rolled up my sleeves, put on my hat, my baseball cap. We went out, and we just sat, and we ate, and we enjoyed ourselves. And they'd sit there, and I said, well, how, how was it? I said, oh, man, it was incredible, blah, 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 blah. And they would just check me. They'd check me. They'd say, man, you know, uh, what's going on with this? Or what's, you, you look like a little boasted. Like your, your chest is a little high, you know. What's, is it getting to your head? I'm like, never, never getting to my head. I'm staying humble. They said, well, the mere fact that you said you're staying humble means you're not humble because a truly hum humble person, when... They checked me, they clocked me, they, they asked me hard questions, things that, but I needed those things. I need people in my life. It doesn't matter how much success, it doesn't matter about those. Those things are important. Mother Jackson, a woman in my church who followed, who I pastored her own church, and when I started a church, she closed the church to come unto me. Now that's a different thing because most people leave a church to go start a church. She closed her church down because she saw something she wanted to submit to. But she didn't care. I'd say something sometime and, and, be a little proud and arrogant, and you know, you get there, and I said, because I'm the apostle, I'm the bishop, blah, 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 blah. And after church, she come on up. She said, baby, come here. Right, right. 
she walk up and grab me by my coat like this. Now, come here. I ain't no apostle and no archbishop. I ain't got no ring like you. And she, but she would tell me, she said, she said, but I'll tell you this. I know God. And if you keep talking like that, you're going to lose him. You're going to lose him. You need people in your life like that. True apostolic ministry does not come to produce 30 preachers sitting on the pulpit all waiting for a chance. You can't even ask them to take an offering because it's a three-hour sermon. I told you to take money, and you're here telling us about the revelation. Nobody cares about your revelation. I ask you to do something simple. But they're all desperate because they think, because we have failed at declaring what ministry is, they think this is ministry. There's no reason why anybody who, is, who has, who's called a minister should not be preaching. There are plenty of places to preach. There are plenty of people to listen. The truth is you don't want to preach. You want to share in the glory of another man's pain. You want to come. The truth is you want the benefits without the price. You don't want to have to preach a church out. You don't want to have to lay foundation and paint walls. You don't want to have to do those things and pastor and, and counsel and all of those things. And so the truth is God wants, to do, God wants to pour out something in the church, but he can't because, why can't he? Because he has to change our way of thinking. Because we're so caught up doing things in a certain way that God says, I would bring revival, but I can't get past the pulpit. I'd bring revival in your church, but why send you a thousand people for, the two, for, for, for some of the men in the church to steal them and start another church down the street at the expense of covenant because that's what happens. And we follow, we go. Thinking be this person must have a greater anointing because they're younger and they're more vibrant and, more, and they're more faithful or whatever it is. And we go and we, we allow the enemy to confuse us and to destroy us. And there's another head. There's another anti-Christ, anti-anointing. Anointing, charisma. Charisma, the group, the group word there. Charisma comes in, in the Greek when you, when you write it out, it, it is primarily, it means mercy. There's the word there that is found in the Greek lettering is, is mercy. The, the, the anointing is a secondary consequence of mercy. The anointing, charisma, the gifts, are the secondary consequence, kara, in the Greek. Mercy implies that I am anointed not because I've done something right. You understand that? Kara, grace, the, word, the root word of, of the anointing is grace. The root word of grace, kara, is joy. So the anointing is the consequence of grace. In other words, whatever I'm accomplishing, I'm not accomplishing because I deserve it. I'm accomplishing because he's doing it in spite of me. The reason he gave me grace, the reason he, he's using me in spite of all of my things is because I enjoy what I, his presence it's not a burden to open my home it's not a burden to to feed people it's not a burden to 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 do the things that i do i love doing i'm not doing them so god is not angry at me i'm doing them because i love what i do when you stop loving what you do and you stop when you lose the joy of god and there are so many people i've been in so many churches and see so many people that just don't enjoy him you are you, are you with me so anyways, listen, turn, turn, I'm going to show you this. And um, Ephesians 4. This is, everybody knows this text. I mean, at least I would hope so. <laughs> Jesus concerning, we're going to read Ephesians 4 in a second, but the Bible says concerning John the Baptist. Jesus looks at the crowds. John the Baptist is in prison. Word comes back to Jesus that John is in prison. And John says, are you, are, the, are you the Messiah? Or should we look for another? See, anytime, hear me, anytime a generation declares the next move of God but does not benefit from it. Can you imagine being a prophet declaring the coming of the Messiah? John prophesies, says, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But now that he's in jail, the message changes. You understand that? The price for being a true prophet is that you will never benefit from what God reveals to you. Prophecy is God speaking through men today about what he's going to do tomorrow. If we could benefit from what we declare, then we would have our own secret agenda, which would mean we would manipulate it. So God speaks to us of generations to come, of things that we will not directly access so that we will never use our gift to benefit ourselves. True gifting always benefits others. I told you last night, go get empty vessels. Empty vessels, Jesus says at a wedding feast. Take those empty vessels. Hello, empty vessels. That means if you want to be filled, you got to empty yourself. When you come to church, when you come into service, you have to lift your hands and say, God, just empty me. I know nothing. I sit at your feet knowing nothing. Speak. And take those empty vessels and fill them with water. Fill them with the word. And when they filled it with water, the vessels were simply vessels with water. There was no wine in those vessels. It didn't become wine, the Bible says, until they poured it out. In the vessel, it was valueless. But when it was poured out for others to enjoy, it became value. Oh, you don't hear me. 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 And, and, and the wonderful thing about that is the people came and said, most people serve the best at the beginning. And you have served the best at the last. Is that there is nothing that the church has seen or experienced that is worthy to be compared with what he's going to do. Are you listening to me? So watch now. What did you go out to see with John the Baptist? He says, what did you go out to see? A prophet? I say unto you, he's greater than a prophet. Since John the Baptist, no man has been like this guy. This is what he says. But here's the problem. You are like children. In the marketplace. And we piped unto you. And you would not lament. Nor would you dance. What did you go out to see? A reed shaking in the wind? Why do you go to church? Why do you go to hear preachers and evangelists? And what is it for? To be entertained? But what's the use? We tell you what God wants you to do. And you don't do anything. You don't cry or laugh. You stay in your complacent religious attitude. You are not changed. But you go to every meeting, every revival, every preacher. Watch now. Jesus says his word. He tells them these words. You are like children in the market. Do you know what? A, you take a child. You take a child, man. You take them to a store. I have some friends of mine, they have the beautiful twins, beautiful twins, just incredible. I said, we're going to go shopping. I'm going to, you know, I'm the godfather. So, you know, this is when I had money. Now they get a happy meal and that's it in Jesus' name. Is. And I keep the toy for myself. That's for, <laughs> desperate times call for desperate measures. But every, and I took them, I said, we got to buy them. I want to buy them some nice things. I said, well, let's, let's go to Neiman Marcus. I, I want to buy something really nice. I, you know, I want them to be sharp, man. I'm taking them through Neiman Marcus, you know. And next thing I know, these little kids, we're walking through the clothes, and we're walking by the fur coats on the top floor, and there's a mink sable coat that's $185,000 for one coat. And I'm looking at these little kids, and I look, and I realize, oh, my God, this child has one of those, you know them little sticks like the apple and mel watermelon they can suck on, you know? Right. And I'm looking, this child has this, and the whole mouth is red, and green and it's all on their hands and they're doing like this and I'm realizing oh my god you don't bring children in a place where there's hundred and eighty five thousand dollar coats because a child doesn't know the difference between granimals you remember granimals underoos they don't know the difference between underoos and, and, and a mink coat and Jesus says to the church, you are like children in the marketplace. You don't know the value of what you have. You disregard it 
and treat it like it's Kmart and you are in the presence of the most valuable thing in the world you come late and you leave early you go to church and you sit there you go to the bathroom three times you sit there and ignore the preacher and can't even tell us what we preached of when the church service is over this generation has missed it we have missed the value of God's presence we are like children. There's in my very soul just saying that brings me almost to tears. I sat homeless in a, in a park, and I say that because I never thought in a million years I would be homeless in a park. I saw homeless in a park, and I saw people that had been with me for 10, 15 years steal my property, put, start their own churches on my money, on things that I'd worked for undermined me lied tried to destroy me took my didn't pay my insurance so that when i was diagnosed with cancer i couldn't even go to the hospital and i sat there and the holy spirit and i began to weep because i understood i spent 20 years of my life preaching there's got to be more and all i wanted to know is is anybody getting it is anybody really changed by the presence of God is there anybody who every day walks in his presence and says surprise me surprise me not I don't need this I don't need this I'll give this up today I told God when it was all over when I came when I got finally a little better and stuff like that I, one guy a friend of mine said man look I want to do this let me bring you on I need an associate pastor I'm gonna put you on staff pay your salary we'll give you six figures car we'll get your beautiful condo by the water you know all these things and you know you cover the you preach for me too and, and, at, and at that time I told him no I don't want to preach anymore I'm through I'm finished I'm over it I don't need it I don't need it I've been I've lost too much I just want to take some time to get to know him again just in his prayer do you understand that, that there are times when you just I just wanted him. I didn't want the church him. I didn't want the accolades. I didn't want, but, the, but the wonderful thing about God is that God doesn't let us have him to the neglect of us. See, he is my heart's desire. And you are the things that help me produce a life worthy of his presence. See, it is only in covenant that what is wrong with me is revealed. As long as I am away from people and isolate myself, I can hide my issues. See, covenant reveals things in your character that you didn't even know was there. Some of you, your children have moved out of your house. They are gone. And you have told them, do not come back. <laughs> and now you got a family member who's going through something. They don't have nowhere to go. And your wife is telling you, we got to let them stay here for a couple months. And you're thinking in your mind, I just got this house to myself. Right? Why? Why don't we want to open up? Because one day you're going to come home from work. And your brother-in-law is going to be sitting on your couch. <laughs> with your remote control, watching your TV. Flipping the channel. And you... God's first cousin, you're saved, sanctified. You're going to come home from work and walk past him and go into your room mad because this man is sitting on your couch, eating your food, watching your TV, and you're going to lose your joy just that quickly. But the problem's not him. See, covenant, letting people in my life reveals what's wrong with me. What's wrong with your patience that something like this could so irritate you? A man who's truly in charge of his countenance and his spiritual welfare doesn't let things like that steal his joy. Some of you can't even make it to church if you get a run in your stockings. <laughs> then it's over. You Forget it. The whole service, you're there miserable with your legs crossed like this. Just, I ain't worshiping you. Amazing the things that steal our joy and our peace. Amazing these things that do this to us. Amazing. God, 
And so as much as I love his presence, as much as I love his presence, as much, God will not let me not do, not be in covenant, not do those things. He says, he says the only way, he says, because Veron, it is in covenant that the things that are within you will be revealed. It is in covenant that I will show you yourself. Myself. Yourself. It's in covenant that I bring out these things and then I remove them. You have to be. That's why you can't have the church. Both he is sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. You can't have the church without Jesus. You can't have Jesus without the church. We're the same thing. Are you with me? Yes. What did you go out to hear? The Bible says that concerning John the Baptist, who was an apostolic voice, but it was an apostolic voice of the end era, the prophetic voice of the voice that, of that old era. He was beheaded. Why? Because there's a new apostolic anointing. There's a new voice. Anytime God brings in a fresh move of God, the old move of God must die willingly. Every man of God, hear me, every generation must know in humility that whatever they are giving birth to today, they will be beheaded tomorrow. That keeps us humble. When the prophet speaks, he comes with a birth certificate and a death certificate. I've come to bring a new move of God, but it's going to cost you the old move of God. God's going to do something fresh, but it's going to cost you being emotionally connected to what God did. You with me? Watch now. Ephesians 4. I'm almost finished with my first point. Relationship, apostolic relationship, when we understand it, and I'm going to show you something in a minute, is far more important. We're not talking about... We're not talking about order for the sake of order. Do you understand that there are people that do things because it's fashionable. They institute things because they change for the sake of change, but not for the sake of God. You know what I mean? There are people who are always cutting edge, but they're not cutting edge because they're cutting edge. They're cutting edge because it's fashionable to be cutting edge. It's the in thing. They, they, they're always with a new revelation, with a new idea, with new something, but not because they are in pursuit of God. They are not describing what they have seen. Oh, I wish you could get this. I wish you could get this. They're not describing what they have seen. They are describing what other popular men have seen. This is, this is my thing, is, is that in 15 minutes, God can give me more revelation than most people get in a lifetime. I don't understand it. I can't, I can't figure it out for you, but I can take a verse that you have read your whole life, and in 15 minutes, God will open it up. And people sit in the church and say, I've been reading that my whole life. How did you get all of that? And it is not for people to take it and say, wow. It is for them to look at that verse and say, how did you get it? You know what I tell them? I said, I go to the guy who wrote it. See, you know the book, but I know the author. I have never memorized scripture. The problem is, is, is that uh, when I lost my library, all of it, and my Bibles and the Greek texts, and all, they're all gone. I don't remember any of the verse. I, don't care, you know, I, I can quote them, but I don't remember where they are. I'm not like these other guys. Again. I don't. I don't know them. I know them, but I don't know them. I didn't commit my life to memorizing scripture. I committed my life to getting to know the guy who wrote and inspired the scripture. And when he reveals it, do you, do you get it? Do you get it that when you get to know him? That's what it's about. And, and so when I preach, it's not for men to walk away and come, say, I got a new truth and birth new truth. No, no, no. It's for men to walk away and say, speak to me like you speak to him. That's all I ask God to do is for you to, for you to walk away and say, oh, you're bigger than I thought you were. You're greater than I imagined you were. Show me your glory. How many of us have so hungry for ministry that we have not passionately pursued him? Show me your glory. And I won't even tell nobody about it. I won't try to write a book about it. I won't. One of the things is that I was... Baker Publishing House, and several other ones, Harrison House, all wanted me to write books. All of them. Everybody, when are you going to write, Bishop? When are you going to write? 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 
because everybody else is taking my stuff and writing it. <laughs> I said, when are you going to write? And every time I go to write it, every time I sit down and I begin to try to write and I begin to try to put it in paper, I become convicted. I'm almost afraid that if I write it, he won't visit me the way he used to visit. I'm almost afraid that if I benefit from his presence, you understand? Do you understand that, that if I try to market it, if I, if, if, if I try, because that's what, what God was saying, you know, you could, you, you could, I love this. I love preaching and talking to men and sitting in, and women and sharing with them the heart because it's, it's, it's like friends sitting together and I'm sharing with you my experience and you're getting it. And you're thinking, wow, that makes sense. But, 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 the, but I'm not marketing. I'm, I'm just not trying to sell it. You don't like it. You don't believe. Walk out. I don't care. It don't cost you nothing. You don't have to put a dime in the offering. You're a grown man. But you buy a book, you're committed, you know what I mean? <laughs> but that, you know, I, I, I esteem the reluctant. I, I, like the, I like those people who say, but I listen to what you said. I'm not sure I agree with all of it. I'm so good. So what are you going to do about it? Argue or go home and read? I'm going to go home and read because I know that, that, that that verse don't say that. Good. Because most of the time we hear preachers and we do nothing. At least if I get you to read. I produce a Berean spirit. Okay, now watch this. So, the, the, I, I don't have, you know, the, there is something about, I wish, I, I wish you could get this. When true apostolic move comes, it will take men and say, I'm here for you, man of God. I am committed to this house. I have no agenda save the glory of the Lord. That's all God, you know what, 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 the Bible says that the whole earth shall be filled with his glory. That's what God wants. God wants an expression of the glory of God. That's all he desires. He doesn't want anything else. He wants the earth that is filled with ignorance and darkness and, and, and hatred and where other people are greedy and selfish. That's when, when any time the church starts to be church, the stories I told you last night was people being church. When you be church, not have church, not go to church, not try to do church. When you become church, when you are filled with his presence, when you are filled, so filled with it that there is nothing left. When you do it and you do these things, you don't do them so that people can pat you on the back and say, my God, she's a real, they do it, they do it every day, they do it, they pick up people that, that other people will drive by, they sacrifice, they go and they cook a little extra food and they put, you know, some more tortillas on the table and put a little extra rice so it can spread out and feed more people than just two and three, you know, they do that because that's what's in their heart. They don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to, how to be selfish. They don't know how to, it, it's, it's their spirit, it's what they do and they're not trying to get benefit, they're not trying to get anything from it. That's the real, that's Evangel that's revival. When people see this, you won't have to beg them to come to church. When people see a church that's being church, you won't have to try to manipulate them and lie to them and tell them, oh, the grass is greener and the sky is blue. The truth is when you get saved, the grass is not greener and the sky is not blue and the devil, doesn't dis the devil does not disappear. And a matter of fact, the reason God gives you a few good days is because the, all the Gehenna, Sheol, Hades, Infierno, whatever you want to call it, all the hell you're going through is going to be so overwhelming that every now and then God gives us a little glory, a little peace, a little joy just to make the pain of the future a little more bearable. But when we can do that, when we can submit it, the Bible says the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord. The Bible says that we are changed from one glory to another glory. We behold his glory in a mirror, the Bible says, in a glass. And we shall behold him face to face. The Bible says we beholding his glory in a mirror shall see him face to face. If I am looking in a mirror, I am seeing the reflection of myself, right? But the Bible says I see him face to face. If I look in a mirror and the reflection in the mirror is him, you don't get it. Listen to what the scripture says. We looking in a mirror through a cloudy mirror, but when the cloud dissipates, I see him face to face. Why? How can I see his face in a mirror that's reflecting me? Because I have become like him. 
Do you get it? Do you get it? And, and, and if I am building my ministry and if I am trying to be successful to the neglect of the glory of God, I will never see his face. See, the purpose is to lose me, to be so consumed with doing what he does that I forget who I am. Here's Peter. Peter, watch Peter. Here's Peter. Peter has denied Christ three times, or he's about to. Jesus tells him, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. Here's Peter. Peter has left Jesus. One moment he's about to fight for him, and when Peter realizes oh, they're going to come for us next, Peter has, he ain't a crip no more. All of a sudden, he's a Quaker. He's the society of the friends of Jesus. All of a sudden, he ain't packing no more. The, the sword and disappeared. He's, you know, he's making, he's selling, you know, hot dogs and tacos outside of the club. You know, here we go. You want something? He's there by the fire. And this girl comes and she says, aren't you one of the ones that was with the Galilean? Aren't you? And in his denial, Peter's sin was worse than Judas's. Judas never denied Jesus. Judas never said, I don't know him. Judas said, I'll show, I can walk right up to him. <laughs> Peter's denial was a far greater transgression than what Judas did. Because Peter had seen the miracles and had known, all, and he said, I don't know him. I don't know who you're talking about. But you can't be in his presence, truly in his presence, and not be changed. Because she said to him, sir, you're a liar. You sound like him. Do you understand I want to be in his presence that if I tried to sin, if I tried to backslide, I couldn't even do it because I would be so filled with his glory. I, 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 wish, I wish you'd get it. I wish you'd, you'd understand that there is a passionate connection to God, that we are so filled with Him. But it only comes when we become free from all of the entanglements of the idea, of the ideology, or, or the need to succeed. Passionate revival. Some of you are men and women, your families, you work hard every day. You go out in the morning and you work and you come home to your kids and you sit on the couch. You turn on TV and you just look for a few minutes. And then next thing, Bible says, I gotta go to church, get ready now, go. And you've been faithful and you've been faithful and you've been faithful, but you've lost your joy because you have not seen the expression of God's kingdom. You have not, you have thought that it was here only and you do it every day, every day, every day. But little do you know that God wants to visit you right there, being a husband, being a wife, being a father, being a mother, and that the glory of God in your home is as valid and as powerful as it is in the church. In the Jewish mindset, according to the Jewish scholars, it says that a woman need never, hear me, uh, this is not applicable now, but the rabbi said, a woman need never attend synagogue for she in serving her children and her husband has accomplished the highest goal. She has sanctified the home where the heart of God is found every day. By, be, by being a wife, do you, understand, do you understand that you are a pastor? You are an evangelist. And the value of your home far exceeds the value of this corporate setting. Because it is there that we are challenged and we can produce people and children and family. If we take the responsibility of our home with the seriousness that these men take with the church, imagine how incredibly changed. Not religious, not coming home and it is time to pray, children. No, it's a dad that says it's time. Get the football. Because that's worship. Worship is not. No, no, no. Get the football. So that your children are not only fearful of you, but begin to enjoy you. Yeah. That when they're 20 and 30 years old, they, when they're sitting with grandpa sitting there, abuelito, he's there and they're sitting. And the kids are saying, you remember when dad was trying to teach us how to play football and fell and broke his head and you know all of them. <laughs> right? Those things, those things that bring smiles to the face. See, that's how God is with us. It's not about, this, it's about enjoying his presence, about the time that, it, like I tell people one time, I said, the first time I experienced healing. It's like an idiot, man. I, 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 I went to 
one of these, um, Billy Cole, Billy Cole was, was, and the people were being healed. I mean, it was like crazy stuff, you know. And I couldn't believe it because, first of all, he could barely walk. Right, right. 500 pounds, man. This brother, he had to wheel him in. And I said, God's going to use him to heal people. You need to get healed. This man have never been on a fast in his life. A Twinkie is not fasting. What is this? I mean, seriously, you know, you sit and you look. And he, and I'm looking, and I know the, some of the people, I know them. And I'm looking at a guy whose leg was twisted, and the foot was turned under like this from birth. The kid was like, he's 29 years old. And he punched this guy in the chest. And I said, we're going to jail, Lord. I hope they got insurance. And he told the guy to get up and walk, and the guy... As he starts to walk with his foot like this, and I'm looking at it, as he starts to walk, each step he takes, the foot gets a little straighter. And you could hear the bones in his leg. God begins to recreate. Boom, boom, boom. And the kid stops, and he's looking because his leg. So you know what I do? Next revival I'm in, bring the sick. If God could use him. Line them up. And these crazy people believed me. That next night, I never saw so many people crooked and... Ret- I mean, they must have went to the street corner. And I thought we would start with a sneeze, a little cold or something. These got the crippled. I said, bring the sick, not the crippled. This is a different spirit. Trying to work my way up. This... Who has the flu? Raise your hands in Jesus' name. (laughs) And I did, man, you know. We called a guy up, man, and I saw it, and I thought it was by faith. You know, I heard these guys talk about that. How how did they get miracles? They said, we did it. We we laid hands, and we believed, and faith moved. And I knew I had faith. And so I got a guy, man, and pulled him from the wheelchair and snatched him up and laid hands and kicked the wheelchair out and said, walk. And I walked ahead of him, and all I heard was, (laughs) I said, next Yeah. I left him there. I walked right by him. I said, oh, praise God. Worship. He's laying before the Lord. Praise him. Hallelujah. No, I'm not lying. Seriously. Now, if I take stuff so serious, I I pray for... Let me tell you something. I pray for the next person. Nothing. They felt same thing. I'm kicking wheelchairs out. When I got to the fourth person, who was an older lady... The pastor jumped up and grabbed the mic and said, praise the Lord, saints. We're going to be back tomorrow. Bishop Ash is going to be praying. A prophet Ash is going to be an evangelist. We're going to be praying all day tomorrow. Praise God, saints, you guys. And ushers, come help the men. And, <laughs> and at first, I was, I mean, I was depressed, man. I was like, I, what happened? And then, you know, I, I, I was, you know, the religious spirit comes on you. But as I went home, And I was repenting to God. Something I must have done wrong. Something, And I could hear God laughing in the spirit. Laughing at me. Like, you gave me a good laugh. I didn't think you were going to go through with it. I mean, could you imagine your father, you know, sitting and watching you do that? Enjoy. He enjoys us. We enjoy him. See, true fathering. And I said, I told you the story because... Because here I thought God had rejected me or something. But, but God, God, you, our children, you know, here you are, your kid, you, you leave your kids alone five minutes. You come home, right? And your seven-year-old son comes out of your room with your shoes size 11 on his little four, you know, too big for him. And your hat all the way over his eyes. And your, you know, you got your coat on and it's dragging. And you know you spent $800 on the suit and the shoes were just $150. And here's your son walking. And you want to whoop him. You want to say, I told you to stay out of my closet. But you can't because he looks so cute trying to look like you. You understand? You enjoy the presence of your children. Because children are children. They do radical, crazy things. And you can't be so busy working and producing and doing the right thing that you don't enjoy their presence. See, worship... It's not only what we do in the church. Worship in his presence is enjoying him. Sometimes the act of worship is a simple act of stopping your car when you're rushing somewhere, looking at the sun, looking at a tree, hearing the sound, opening the window, getting some fresh air, and saying, I love you. 
It is as important as what we do corporately. We have gotten so confused. We have esteemed these moments that we no longer find him in the solitude and the simplicity of our everyday life. It is only when I find him there that I become useful here. You get it? You get it? Watch. Watch. Ephesians 4. I've been trying to get there all night. I got um, Ephesians 4 and 11. Now, the, now the, the, this text, as popular as it is, has to be understood within context. We're going to show you something here because I have a lot to say about this. But God does not set God does not set up offices in the church for the sake of offices. They all have a reason. You understand that? God, God, God doesn't just give out new titles. Everybody's trying to get a title. Everybody, we, we follow titles to the neglect of authority. No, you don't have to call me a prophet. You don't have to. You will know when the Lord is through speaking that a prophet was in your midst. Everybody wants the title. And anyways, the fivefold ministry, well, l- let me just read this to you, and then I'm going to say something, but let me just read it. Let me read it first, or else I would never read it. But 4.11, 4.11 says this. Oh, let's start for four, seven. But to each one of us, the grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the same one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints the work of ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of son of of the son of God to a perfect man to the measure and the stature the fullness of Christ himself let me say this to you there's no verse in the Bible that precedes a man's name with a title none it's never the Apostle Paul never the prophet Nathan it was always Paul an apostle. It was never the apostle Paul. It was Paul an apostle. Because your office will never precede your person. See, it is your uniqueness. If everybody tries to be Stone King, or everybody tries to be Jakes, everybody tries to be Juanita Bynum, then they're not being who God made them to be. Paul's apostleship was only important because it was Paul. The things that you like, the gifts that you have, the strengths that you have, the the desires that you have, all of those things are intricately connected to what God wants you to do. You cannot kill the talent because now you're saved. You have somebody that sings or raps or paints or can sculpt or can carve or can do something. And they give it up now that they're in church because they're so busy that they don't have time to pursue the things that they love. But their anointing is intricately connected to their personality. God uses that to touch people that my preaching will never touch. There are some people that will never come to a church. Never. But if you do what you do, You will connect to other people who may never walk in the church and your talent will give access to see the gospel. How many people have we killed their gift and talent because we got them so busy being religious they couldn't be themselves? And true salvation is the releasing and the revealing of who God called you to be before you were in your mother's womb. He told Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before your mother went on a date with your father, before your granddaddy asked your grandmama for her phone number, before any of those things happened, 
God already had a destiny for you. And the problem is, is the moment you were born in the world, everybody tried to superimpose their idea of what God wanted you to do. Your parents had already planned out your future. Your babysitter just wanted you to be quiet. Your schoolmates wanted to put peer pressure on you to fit in with the clique. The teachers had to get a certain percentage in order for the school to get certain loans and grants. And in order to do that, they had to force you to fit into a certain particular group so that they could get the things that they want. And then the worst thing is you got saved in the church and now you dress like everybody and look like everybody and speak in tongues. It's like there's no uniqueness to you, nothing. And deep down on the inside, there is a flame that God is breathing on and saying, but I want you. I want the gift and the talent that you are. See, the fivefold ministry, an apostle, apostles govern, prophets guide. The prophet is the eye. Apostles govern. No, no, no. The prophets guide. The evangelists gather the pastor guards and the teacher grows when the fivefold ministry is in full function in the church you will have people whose lives are filled with every aspect of the kingdom they will be in right position they will have a valid idea of their future they will be in covenant with others they will be protected from the powers of darkness and they will be spiritually mature the apostle who the bible says that jesus is the apostle of our faith right Amen. the bible says that there is no prophet greater moses was the greatest of all these prophets the, the, the scribes the, the pharisees said moses being the greatest of all of these things and the scribes said, how can a man do these things except God be with him? Jesus was referred to as one greater than the prophets and one greater than Moses himself. He was the greatest prophet to declare God's will. He was the greatest evangelist. Jesus could not go to any city and the multitudes come and sit at his feet. He was the greatest pastor. He himself made constant reference to the shepherd. He is the good shepherd, the shepherd of Psalms 23. He was the greatest teacher who could sit on a rock and take everyday things, parables, and reveal the glory of God's kingdom. The fivefold ministry, I'm showing you something in a minute here. So the fivefold ministry, when we see this text here, when we see this passage of scripture, this verse does not begin with Paul. I'm almost, what time is that? It's almost nine o'clock, it's early. Of course, I should have been here an hour and a half earlier, and you were, but that, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord, listen. Paul is the first guy to steal somebody else's sermon. Well, maybe not the first, but the first person to really publicly do it and not give any credit. <laughs> Paul didn't originate this text. Paul quotes somebody else. He quotes the book of Psalms. Now, in order to understand this verse, you have to understand it within the context of its original revelation. If you have your Bible, turn with me now to... Psalms, watch this, and watch this. And most of you know the verse, Psalms uh, 67, or 68 actually, in, I'm reading out of the Septuagint, so, but 68, uh, verse 19. When you have it, say amen. Oh, y'all got the fancy stuff, I'm sorry. I just, you don't even open your Bibles anymore, you look at the screen. <laughs> Psalm 68. 19. You ascended on high. You led captivity captive. That, that, or maybe it's because uh, I'm reading out of the Septuagint, verse 19, which may be 18. Verse 18. You ascended on high. You led captivity captive. You received gifts for men. For the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Sound familiar? Now watch. Paul says, you ascended on high. You led captivity captive. Paul, you ascended on high. 
You had a captivity, captive David. You received gifts for men. Paul, you gave gifts unto men. David, for the rebellious also. Paul, he that ascended is the same also that's in it. He that was in heaven preached to those that will be in hell. For the rebellious also. David, that the Lord might dwell among them. Paul, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. David, that the Lord might dwell among them. Paul, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. David, that the Lord might dwell among us. Paul, you want to see him? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The church, we have pastors, we have teachers, we have evangelists. But the church has neglected the apostle and prophet. Therefore, it has kept us ignorant and has kept us from our call. Because our call is not to be preachers. Our call is to be like him. But I can't be like him unless I see him. And I can't see him unless he's in my midst. And he's not in my midst unless the fivefold ministry is being fivefold ministry. You got it? So a church that robs me. I had Pentecostals tell me there are no more apostles. I said, you're ignorant. If there are no more apostles, the Bible says that they will remain. He gave these ministries for the perfecting of the saints. I said, well, then you're perfect. And the church is in unity. And it is neither. We are not perfect and we are not in unity. And the fivefold ministry, when it is truly reflected, it will chip away at the things. It will call the fire of God. It will call the church into humility because you will be able to see it expressed, not in preaching, but in life. Yeah. Fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The Lord might dwell among us. He dwells among us through the fivefold ministry. You take one of those ministries, if you don't let the prophets prophesy, if you don't let the, the apostles bring the government and the church and the order in the church, the thing is we don't want these gifts because we cannot, we can't truly submit to these anointings. An apostolic gift, when an apostle walks in a room and the people all day been cleaning, they've been cleaning, 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 Setting up all the chairs. When the apostle walks in the room, he sees the one chair that's out of place, a little crooked. Because the apostle is so anointed to bring order. Anything that's not in order is what draws his attention. It, 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 it's hard to work with an apostle. Because you don't get a lot of credit. You say, I've been all day straightening up all these chairs. And you're going to say one chair? In Jesus' name, I'm going to First Baptist. Forget this. <laughs> but because the apostle's concern, and the apostle has to know, an apostolic voice has to know, that that one chair is not the important thing. But it's your natural tendency. A apostle can be critical and can make it very hard for people that, that are connected to him because he, all he does is see the things that are out of order. But God has gifted him to see the things that are out of order so that he can bring order. And he cannot get sidetracked because God has not called him to straighten up chairs. God has called him to straighten up people. To bring, you understand? And so, really, as an apostolic voice, I, I had a woman who was with my ministry for 10 years, 10, years, 15, 10, 11 years. This woman, in the end, I never ordained her. I never laid hands on her. I never licensed her. I barely let her, you know, she, she was preaching, running revivals all over the country. You know, she made her own business card. She ordained herself. She made herself an apostle. She's ignorant. And I don't care. She did all of these things. She stole my property. She lied on me. She manipulated. I'm telling you, by the time it was over, I was sick in the hospital, and I had signed over my power of attorney so she could take care of some things. She robbed me of over $150,000, this woman did. While I was in the hospital with nothing, she took, because she had power of attorney, my own accounts and took the money. I don't even know. Took, stole the church, started her home ministry, told people that I ordained her. And then I wanted to lay hands on her, but it was not for ordination. <laughs> and I'm 
going to lay the five-fold ministry on her in the name of... <laughs> but anyways, all of it. For 10 years she was in ministry. For 10 years she asked me to be ordained. For 10 years she wanted to be, me to lay hands on her. For 10 years. And every time I looked at her, I said, you're not ready. She hated me. She hated me. She despised me. And at the first opportunity when she saw I was weak, like a, a wolf's, I did not know that people could be inherently evil. Inherently, they could see you dying and not help you. I couldn't, I, I, I believe the best in people. When I see people, you know, I, I just want to believe that everybody's okay. You know, that's probably why I my first mistake, but you know. And so they, I, I couldn't understand it. But see, my commitment to apostolic ministry is, if you're going to go to a church and those people have heard the things that I have said, I don't even claim to be semi-intelligent. There are men far more intelligent and genius than myself. I only claim to be passionate. I don't, my preaching is not designed to impress. It is designed to empower. It's designed for you to walk out of this room hungry for God, to say, to say what is it about Bishop Ash that you, that you like listening to him? I don't know, but it may, he makes me want to pray. He makes me want to seek God. That's what, he makes me, I walk out of church loving God more than I did before. That's, that's, the, you know, that's all I want. That's all I want. So I told her, I said, I can't send you. You go to a church and you lining people up in the prophecy line with a hundred dollars. And you're telling every person in the church that they're gonna be a millionaire and gonna buy a Mercedes. First of all, that's not prophecy, that's witchcraft. That's manipulation. Half these people can't drive the, the Toyota they got got broken and stuff. God ain't gonna give them a Mercedes. You, you, you getting it? She was not ready. She, was, she wanted to be a Juanita Bynum. She wasn't a hungering for the things of God. And my, whole, and, and my commitment was, you're not ready. Truthfully, I told her one day when she, she came and she was just in tears. You're my father. Why would you? I told her, I said, I'm not your father. I'm not your father because you do not have my spirit. And truth be told... I have already seen your future. I will never ordain you because your heart is not right. I'm telling you, she didn't, when the day she started ministry, let me tell you how proud and arrogant, sickening. She had not been a pastor for a month. She already had a special chair. She had people bringing her a glass of water. Here you go. Because that's what she wanted. Somebody carrying her briefcase. That's what she wanted. She didn't want the price paid she didn't want to she didn't want to sit and study when I told her originally when I would sit I would tell people you want to know I had 10,000 books that was half of what I had before to just get I gave the rest to the library and then and all those books were gone and she knew anybody that was in my ministry anybody that was connected to me anybody when you looked at their library there were at least two three hundred books People came to me and asked for stuff, and I said, well, here, here's a list. Let's start with this. Let's go here. Let's go to Bonhoeffer. Let's, have you read Karl Barth? Karl Barth was the survivor of the German Holocaust, and when he survived the Holocaust, he, he from Germany came to America and became a theologian, one of the greatest thinkers of critical theology and systematic theology. He wrote five books and changed the view of uh, American Christianity, and when most of the colleges had become secular and had become carnal, he brought a revolution, and through his teaching, that brought forth a revival and, and, and a fresh induction of men. These are the things I read, but most of the people, she couldn't pronounce half the words in the first page. My God. You, and I said, you're not getting it. You're not hungry for more. You, you can only, you only give what you have. If you don't put nothing in, you know, there's an old thing where they used to say when DOS, when, when they had written DOS and started programming came out, and you remember the garbage in, garbage out. I told her, I said, I know what you're feeding. I know who you listen to. I know the preachers that you listen to. And all you're going to do is regurgitate their stuff. You're not going to be hungry for the presence of the Lord. There is no I would have, The one chance I gave for her to pray, I said, now pray. Prayer is an intimate connection between God and a person. It is a conversation. Prayer is the true. See, I know who God calls to preach. You know how I know? I listen to them pray. When I have prayer meeting, when they have prayer meeting, I'm there with them. Yeah. And they're praying, and, I, and I'm walking, and I'm saying, Father, move, and I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening to the young guy who's an accountant. 
and his husband, and he has kids, and he doesn't care about ministry. He's happy doing what he does, but I hear him. I hear him. I hear something in his voice that says, he ain't going to be accountant forever. And then I hear this woman who has business cards and briefcases and everything else. And her words are the echo of someone else's. They're not her. They're not passionate. They're, you ever met somebody when you were a young person? You remember you met, you had a friend and they fell in love? Y'all remember? And, and, and you're hanging out with them and you, and you got sick. You say, you know what? Just go. Don't even hang out with us no more. You know, Johnny, what's wrong? Where's Johnny? The niña, he, look at her. Oh, she's taking all her friends now. She, all of them. And you listen, your, your friend, your little girlfriend, you know, she's in love with Johnny. And you're there talking, you're all talking about getting ready, you know, the big, going to conference and you're trying to pick out your dresses and everything because that, God may send you your husband, so you got to work this stuff out. But she already found somebody she's in love with. And, and you say, hey, what are you going to do? What are you, are you, we got to practice the music for the choirs. And, and there she is with her pen and a school book and she's drawing a little heart. And she says, Johnny loves Maria, she puts a little heart. Johnny's last name is, you know, whatever. Roberts, Maria, Roberts. She's in love. Her speech betrays her. Everything that she does speaks volumes. This is not just a crush. You want to hang out? No. He's going to call me tonight. When you're in love, when you're in love with God, you want to hang out after church? No, he's going to call me tonight. You want to go to Denny's? No, I got a date after. I'm in love. You want, to, you, you want to be used by God? There's nothing wrong with hungering. It is a good thing. He that desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. There's nothing wrong to desire it. But let your path to the pulpit be at the altar. Find your way there through brokenness at his feet. Let him pick you up from his feet and raise you up in a group of people who said you never amount to anything. God raises apostolic ministry. And you know what the apostle, the apostle is here to see. He's here to see when you're ready. And he knows. It's not, it's, there's, there's, no, there's no shortage. There's no, it will be obvious. It will be obvious because you will be passionate. And your passion will be, will be produced and it will be evident. And you're not trying to harm. You're trying to heal. A true person that is called to apostolic greatness and apostolic ministry, a true prophetic voice will never divide. It will bring unity. The fivefold ministry is here to bring us together. I don't care how anointed you are. If you split, if you hurt, if you push away, if you attack the man of God, if you destroyed, if you tried to sow seeds of discord, if you think you're more anointed or more gifted or more talented, the truth is you are none of those things. You are only deceived. You are deceived. You have come under the spirit of a false Christ, a false anointing. Because the real anointing brings unity. He ascended on high. He led captivity. I love that text. He captured captivity. He bound the binding. He led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. There's something so beautiful. It is poetic. It is poetic because it, it, it speaks volumes. Here's David speaking of the Lord and he says, He ascended on high. He led captivity captive and gave gifts. Do you understand that the first two passages are so great? And then David uses the word men in a diminishing fact. It is to say, do you understand he who ascended on high. He who took the greatest enemies of mankind. And when our armies could not subdue them with a word, he captured captivity. Loved us enough. Oh, David. David was a worshiper. David always dealt with the... The dichotomy or oh, 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 the, 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 the friction and, and, and the, uh, the, the diminishing fact that God who is great keeps involving himself in the history of men because men do not deserve him to be involved in our history. He, we messed it up and yet he has not given up hope on us. He keeps giving us gifts even though we keep abusing them. He keeps 
Anointing is, what is man, David says, that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him, you have made him a little lower than the angels. Do you understand that man, when God creates the universe and the world and all that he makes, he makes it with only one thing in his mind. God does not, on the first day, create unless he already understood that on the sixth day, he was going to make man. Everything that he made, he made because man would enjoy it. God did not make a rose smell different than a lilac and a lilac smell different than an orchid for his enjoyment. He made each flower different so that man could walk through the vastness of the world and see the differentiation that was made for us. How much do you love us that there is not only one color called purple, but there is magenta and lilac and violet, shades of purple to the thousands, shades of red to the hundreds of thousands from crimson to ember, every color seen. Why? Because our eyes would be so finely tuned that we would see the majesty of these colors for no other reason, for no reason. It doesn't benefit us. It doesn't help us for no other reason than for our enjoyment. And we rush home at the end of the day and all we want to do is turn on the news. And God says, but look what I gave you. Aria Kaplan, one of the great writers of um, recent Jewish uh, spirituality writes, concerning the ways of the prophets and the school of the prophets that were taught, we have some oral tradition. Mary Kaplan says that when the prophets could not hear the voice of God, they removed themselves from society and left into the wilderness there to find God in his creation and reignite their ability to hear. In other words, he was saying that the prophets sometimes have so many people around them that they get deaf to hearing God. And when they get back and they see a flower, nobody watered or cultivated, but on its own, yeah. it became beautiful, filled with, they saw the glory of God and that glory of God rekindled their flame to hear God. Do you understand that, that that's what, that real, real passion, I told you last night, when I was in seminary, when I was in Bible college, I would go to pray and I would go off and there was a wood, some woods, some trees there in Miami Beach. And so I'd go and I'd go over there. There's a little water out there and I'd go every day to eat my lunch and pray. Because for me, prayer is not sitting on my knees and that's not prayer. I don't know what that is. It's not prayer. Sometimes I would have a sandwich and I would tell the Lord, I said, you want some? It's bologna, it's all I got, you know. Oh, okay, no problem. Well, I'll eat it, then I'll have your back. Peace, too. You got anything extra you want to kick down? Let the Lord, let yourself use you. <laughs> I enjoyed I would eat lunch with him. People didn't get it, but that was prayer. That was prayer. It was being in his presence. It was, it was every day I was there, and I'll never forget that one day I went, um, there's a man, Heschel, Abraham Heschel. Abraham Heschel said, he writes a book. He, Abraham is a Jewish uh, theologian and philosopher. And he was invited to march in the civil rights movement, marching next to uh, Martin Luther King. And you'll see some pictures in Birmingham. This Jewish man is standing next to Martin Luther King, and they're marching for civil rights. And when they asked him, what, was, what were you thinking when you were marching in the African-American civil rights movement? He says, my feet were praying. Do you, do you understand that, that he understood that my, my conscious involvement in righteousness. See, righteousness is not only living right. Righteousness is seeing people that are taken advantage of and abused and are not benefiting and doing something about it. Righteousness is not looking at another drunk Indian who had an accident, but saying, what can we do? Because the American community has failed at taking care of the responsibility. All we do is give them casinos. What do we do to change this thing? 
We already robbed them. What can we do to make it right? Because when righteousness comes, it wants to make things right. True prophets don't look for pulpits. They look for people don't have a, that don't have a voice. And the prophet becomes a voice. The prophet, in the Old Testament, the prophets always became a voice. He, read, read Ezekiel, who says, Woe unto you, O Israel who have taken your widows and esteemed them as harlots, who have taken your children and orphans and treated them like common pagans. God has rejected you. Why? Because the prophets could not see people suffering and not declare the word of the Lord against them. That's my feet. I would go and I would have lunch with Jesus. It's what I did. I didn't sit there and pray deep theological prayers. I talked to him. I told him, I said, I'm having a problem with Greek. The classical Greek is a little different than the Koine, and the Koine is, is common, but I, I don't understand uh, the, the, the gender and the, you know, and I said, you know, and I don't know if you speak Greek, <laughs> but <laughs> if you could hook me up, Give me a Rosetta Stone or something, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's how my relationship has always been with God. It, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is sitting in His presence and talking and saying, I'm struggling, man. I'm struggling. I'm lonely. I've lived my whole life single. I'm lonely. And I come home and I deal with depression sometimes because I sit there by myself and I get up every morning to catch my flights and I get in my car by myself. And I know you've not called me to marriage because that poor lady would drive. She'd be on Prozac, counting your fingers in the corner, coming up with 11. I drive myself crazy. I wouldn't marry me. I know. But I tell him, I said, I said, if you don't help me, God, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fall. If you don't, if you don't feel this supernaturally, there's a part of me that is so longing for companionship. I'm going to make a mistake. And, and ain't no, you know, being bishop and holy and a hondolo bullshit. No, that's just how I feel. And. And that sister down the street, she kind of cute there. And I'm, and she working out, she working over at that restaurant. And every day I'm going for lunch because I like the food. That's how it is. And I have friends, real men that are my friends. And I pick up the phone. I said, boy, you better pray. Why? This is a little girl. She's intelligent and pretty. And, and I've been having, I've been going for lunch every day. You know, and, I, and I'm getting too comfortable there. And my friends, and, and they're cool like that. They know, they don't take the bishop or the prophet, you know, they, they like, they're like, I understand, man, you know, you got my number. Don't, you go to call her, you call me. I don't care what time of night. I have people that are like that. People that I could be like, see, if you don't have somebody you could open your heart up to and share those things, they become monsters. They become monsters. A husband ought to be able to look at his wife and say, oh my God, that, that's pretty. That young lady is a pretty young lady. But see, if he, if he, you know, pretty is pretty. Just because you got saved don't mean that pretty ain't pretty no more. Pretty is still pretty. You are all of a sudden, you saved. I don't. Pretty is pretty. I don't. I'm like, woo. User. Anoint. Hando. Shabbat. You know, that's the truth. So I look. If I keep it hidden, see the truth is, if I keep it here and make it dirty, all I'm thinking now is she's pretty. But if I can't share that with anybody, if I'm, even my own wife, I say, wow, that's a pretty young lady. If I'm too embarrassed, then it becomes defiled. What was innocent now becomes filthy. What was admiration now becomes lust. And I become a prisoner. J uh, James Robinson said that he overcame a spirit of lust to the point that when he finally got delivered from, from lust, him and his wife go through the mall and she'll see somebody that she knows, you know, he has a certain type that he likes, you know, or whatever, that he, he just thinks is pretty. That's normal. We all have our attractions, you know? And so he, uh, you see, and she'll stop and she'll say, oh my God, did you see that young lady? She has a perfect, look, perfect figure. I mean, she's beautiful, perfect, incredible. She should be a model. And he'll look and say, wow. He says, ever since him and his wife got that comfortable, he has never lusted. Never. Because now he can say, she's beautiful, without desiring it. 
You, do you understand that the, the church has caused us to be so religious, but they have caused us to be weak. They have destroyed our true faith because we're so busy trying to be what we think is the idea of righteousness that we are not living right. I have found that my true faith, my true, the true call for apostolic ministry was with me building relationships. See, it's building friendships and relationships that reveal who we are. You can't call people that don't open their life. You can't trust them. You can't trust people with this because this foolishness God has chosen that men might be saved. And if I let you hear what is it that I'm letting here? Because Peter says, silver and gold have I not. But such as I have, I give unto you. What is it that you have that's being transferred in preaching? Now all of a sudden there's a spirit of division in the church. A spirit of lust on the men because we let someone in the pulpit who couldn't be truthful with God and passionate get there and now he's transferred the spirit to the house because words transfer the spirit because the bible says that the children of israel sent 12 men into the camp of the giants and they came back of the philistines and when they came back uh, in the promise never they came back and they said and joseph joshua and caleb said we have seen them god has made them bread unto us when they listened to the other men the other men said we are as grasshoppers in their sight and because the majority of the spies brought back a negative reproach the spirit of fear filled all of israel and for another 40 years they could not inhabit the promised land because they received the spirit of somebody preaching that was not passionately pursuing the things of god so it's not that we are not trying to release people in ministry it's that we know the consequences of people that are not hungry for god You got it? I'm finished. I'm through. I'm almost done. I'm done. I'm through with it. One more verse and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just we finish Ephesians 4. I, there's so much I have to say and I'm just <laughs> rambling. But you know, we, y'all bring me back in a couple months. I'll be all right. I'll be a little better. I just bought a Bible again, so I'm going to have to read it again to get some stuff. <laughs> Let me say this. He says these words in this text that are mind-blowing to me. Paul says... He led captivity, captivity of his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Go back to Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. He says that we come to the full measure and the stature of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that the fivefold ministry, next verse, verse 12, the fivefold ministry is designed to bring us to the full measure and the stature of Jesus Christ. It is not designed to make the next generation of preachers like this generation. It is designed to make them like him. It is easy to pattern men after ourselves. It is easy. You can learn my cliches, my style. You can learn my colloquial terms, my mannerisms. I have a friend of mine in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's a young preacher from a Baptist church. He can mimic me. I mean, you know, he left a message on my machine one time, you know, and I answered my, I, I'm checking my messages, and on my message he says, we have come to give glory to your glory. We have come, O oh God, to praise and to ascribe to your great name the things worthy and befitting of your majesty. You know, and I'm thinking, did I pray on my phone? And so with the unending hymn of praise that is sung both by angels and archangels, principalities, powers, dominions, the many-eyed cherubim and the six-winged seraphim were covering their faces and feet flying to one another, declaring that you are holy. Is that Bishop Ash? This is this Brother Johnson. I'm just here to say amen. <laughs> Mimic. Here's my style. But it's not my job to make men like me. The reason we have to live a crucified life it's because it is easy to make men like us. But we are called to make men like him. We are called to bring a church who is weak, filled with sin and failure. 
We are called to bring them to his feet. We cannot bring them to his feet arrogantly. We cannot bring them to his feet in any way but that that is appropriate, humble and broken. And so the Bible says that we come to do this, simply this, that we may bring the church to the full measure. I love this. The work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. Go ahead, next verse, verse 13. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Do we all come in the unity of the faith? We know that that's not, we haven't seen that yet. And the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How long do we preach? We preach until you're like him. What do we preach? We preach that you should be like him. When do we stop preaching it? We stop preaching it when you become like him. It is the becoming like him that is the true revival that he's looking for. It is filled with such a contingent of people that have lost their own identities, their own vested interest in success, only to be filled with the glory of God and the passion for the things of God. Can you imagine a generation of people that are not trying to get revivals and get booked at a church? They're just trying to, to get him. I, 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 had a, I mean, I, I'm dealing with some things right now. I'm dealing with some stuff. I'm dealing with reforming my ministry and all of the, what, what am I going to do and what does he want to do? And I'm having to ask myself, are these the things that are necessary? I mean, we do things, but, I, but I'm not putting anyone down, but like, you know, I, I, I don't want to take pictures. I don't. I don't want a promotional package. We used to have a package. My package had my degrees and all of the things that I have accomplished. And, and sometimes I go to church and they, the pastor would have it. He would feel obligated to read it. But none of it's important. It's all dung. It's all, it's, it's all filthy in the presence of God. And people don't need to see what I look like. You said it a year ago, my... my colon it torn I had gotten what's called a fissure in it. it was so high up that they couldn't see it with the cameras didn't know it was there so that within eight to ten days my body had become septic which means the poisons that are supposed to be transferred out of your body stayed in my body I became so sick that I became what's called neuroseptic that the poisons had entered into my spinal cord right now I have no vision my left eye I've lost 70% of my vision my equilibrium is off um, my body was covered in spots and blotches. My whole face, uh, my mouth, and, and I lost hair. I was, in 10 days, I was not, I was not pretty. I told him I had to go get a picture for a new ID. And when you look at it, you think, oh my God, this man, is, is he dead? Is he in a tomb? It was so bad. You know, and I was ashamed to walk out of the house. When I got out of the hospital, they said, it's gonna take months for the stuff to clear. I was on machines that I had to go home on for over two months that were pumping antibiotics and, and um, different um, prednisone, uh, what are steroids and things into my body to help build uh, the structure, uh, those things, that, to, all these things. And I went through some surgery. They, at this point, they had found that the, the, the cancer had, 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 or the par parts of things that went into the lymph nodes, which meant that they could, a surgery would not cure what I had. They just had to fight it and pray and hope that God would, all of these things. You're dealing with it stuff. And, and the, you know, and I told God, I said, I said, whatever you do, I just, at this point in my life, it should be over. I should have been dead. You know, I'm starting. It's not about me. I don't, I'm not, I don't want any of those things. I don't want, somebody said, man, I, I didn't get you back on TBN. I said, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want my success to be found in the hands of men. I want to be like John the Baptist in obscurity declaring the kingdom of God the kingdom of God the kingdom of God and there are people for five years I disappeared for it was five years ago I started to go through my trial and I disappeared one day I was there one day I was everywhere and literally in two weeks I was gone people thought I moved to India people said I died people thought I became a Muslim they thought I became all kind of stuff people said that I was in a monastery took a vow of silence that I was never coming out again all kinds of stuff I just it was over all of that and every time every now and then every couple months somebody i one of my friends or somebody would have a computer or something or i'd go to 
an internet cafe and I have some money or something like that or when I was and I just type in my name to see what and there were people there who were saying we don't know where he is but we're praying yeah. we're praying because nobody feeds us since we've heard this thing when you eat meat you can't go back to milk and they said we just we don't care we don't care whatever happened we hope God restore them I, one person on this there were people said that I, that I had become a drug addict other people said that I had ran away with a girl and got some other people said that there's all kind of stuff and one person wrote the most beautiful thing she, she said I don't care what he did she says I'm starving and I want God to bring him back if for nobody else she said he can come back and sit in my living room and preach to me you know, and, and it broke me. Tears were in my eyes because that's who we're called to. We're not called to the, to the masses. Listen to this. And I'm finished. I'm serious with this. And I'm through. I'm going I'm to finish with this and we're, we're going to go home. I'm going to pray apostolically over you. And then tomorrow, I, I, I hope you'll be here. Those of you that go to your local churches, go to your local church. And when your service is over, just run out and get here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to pay your tithe there. Leave your money. Your tithe goes to your house. But bring your offering over here too. But be here because there's a prophetic command on my life but anytime I am under an unction to teach like this there is such I have prophesied for two and a half hours tonight everything that I said is prophetic it is ignorant of us we didn't want somebody to call us out prophetic declaration is more than just saying hey you sometime I will hear people he, my brother here uh, brother Jose said that he, uh, he was listening to a tape and I was prophesying to another guy this is in Hawaii. And I was prophesying to somebody else. It wasn't even him. He said, but Bishop Paul, you were prophesying to him. I swear you were prophesying to me. It was, I know it wasn't for me, but it looked like it was. I said, it was for you. When God speaks, he speaks on so many levels. Who is to say he's only speaking to you? The word of the Lord, if it applies to you, it applies to you. And so we hear the word of the Lord like this. And, we, and if you sit there and anything that I said has convicted you or, or touched you or spoke to you, if, if it sounded like I was speaking just to you, guess what? God was speaking just to you. Very few of the Old Testament prophets did personal prophecy. Very few. This whole personal prophecy thing is a new phenomenon that was not found in the Bible. Really, it, it, it almost borders on witchcraft and spirituality. Because first of all, I don't need to tell you your name. Why? What is the benefit? Ah, oh, but it's faith. But you're a, you're a Christian. I'm trying to produce faith and you're already saved. There's something wrong. I'm not saying that it's not God. And I'm not blaming the man. But there's something wrong with us that God has to prove himself to those who are already called. I don't need any. You, I, don't need, I don't need another prophecy. If I never hear God speak another day in my life, he has said enough. I can never live and fulfill all of the things he's already said. God forbid that I pull on a prophet to call me out. When there are people who will benefit far more from the word of the Lord who are unbelievers and I'm sitting here trying to get a prophecy because I want to pro I want to say I'm gonna preach I want to say I'm gonna preach I want to say I'm anointed I want to say I don't you don't need prophecy for that it's gonna happen you, you do you understand we have diminished we have apostles in our church who are supposed to be bringing here's this man of God this is the thing the Lord spoke to me last night I went home and we didn't talk I told him I told him I said man I don't want to talk much to you because Everything that I say, I want to be from the, the Lord. So, I'm, you know, don't, don't share much. Several times, he said, he said I ain't going to say nothing because I want God to speak. So I went home in my, I was sitting in my room. I was sitting in my room, I was falling, I was just really tired. I'm really tired a lot now. And, and so I said, I'm praying there and the Lord spoke to me and God said, Veron, my people have hindered my men and women from accomplishing what I have called them to accomplish. My servants have become babysitters when I have called them to be pioneers. And God said they're frustrated. And they don't even know why they're frustrated. Because they think that's what their job is. They think it's their job to dry noses and tears and pat people on the head. And, because that's what pastoring is. And go to the house and visit them when they don't but that's not what pastoring that's not what the true apostolic ministry is everyone that is the head of a church is not a pastor a pastor is not always the head of a church and so he said I, they're so busy 
we might people pulling on them to do these things that they cannot declare the dimensions of truth and when they do declare the dimensions of truth they come in seasons and then everything goes back to normal and then there'll be a, a declaration of truth but then people get so busy dealing with their own stuff that we have to stop. We have to tell two people in the church who've been members of the church for 20 years. But because one sister was outside and she was trying, you know, she was making, helping with the food and stuff like that. And she offended one of the other guy's wives because she was trying to do something and she didn't do it right. So the person got offended because they didn't, you know, they didn't make it the exact same way that she did. And she told her, well, I got it. Don't worry about it. Now, all of a sudden, outside at the food stand, they're supposed to be making some money to help for the church. You got people hating each other in the church. Now, the pastor who is hearing the deep things of God, the apostle who wants to declare the revelation of God has to come outside and take two people that are Christians, been in the church 20 years, sit them down and tell them, Hey, do you love her? Yeah, I love her. You love her? Yeah, I love her. What's the problem? I'm just tired of being disrespected in this church. I have done things for 30 years and I'm da 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 da. And now I'm here like a kindergarten teacher speaking to adults of things they should know. Paul says, I would speak unto you as spiritual, but I can't because you're carnal. You understand? Get over yourself. You can't do I, I got to get up every Sunday. Every Sunday as I get up and said, we're about to raise the tithe in the offering. Tithe, 10% of your income. Whatever God has prospered you with, 10% of it belongs to God. If you use the tithe for anything, you have robbed God. You will be cursed with a curse. Every week I have to repeat that. Every week I have to get up and deal with the tithe. Why? Because when I look at the giving of the church, there are some of you that have been coming for years, but you're not tithing. How can I share with you the deep things of God when the principal doctrines of Christ are not lived? You understand? You understand that? These are principal things. Some stuff you ought not have to tell people. Right? I would speak unto you spiritual, but I cannot because you're carnal. If we would grow unto the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Listen to me. I said it last night. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Cannot handle the headship of Jesus Christ. He said, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Why is there nowhere to rest his head? Because the body is not mature enough to handle his head. Jesus is not talking about some place to sleep. He had many homes. He could have slept at Lazarus' house. He had property in Bethany, property in Nazareth. He, he could have slept. He wasn't not talking about some place to sleep that night. He said that the foxes have holes. The birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. He's looking for a church that is not saying, come down to us, but they will grow up into him that we may grow up into him the full measure of the statue of Jesus Christ that we would be willing to deal with the weight of his head now what kind of head is it what kind of as we told you this last night behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity when brethren who are brethren Jesus is our elder brother we are his younger brother when we dwell in unity when we dwell in unity whatever anointing runs down Aaron's beard the beard represents maturity children don't have beards you want to know why you're not anointed you don't have a beard if I'm talking to you about children things God's not gonna send the anointing because you can't handle it the anointing is released when you are mature enough to handle it you know one day I was looking at some stuff and I saw Clorox bleach it on the side it said keep out of the reach of children why because something that cleans and disinfects and whitens whites something that has so many positive benefits in the hands of children is destructive I am afraid that we have entrusted children with the deep things of God and instead of passionately finding God, we started new denominations, new religions, and missed the move of God. But there are voices in the kingdom today. There are voices. He shared with me. He sat with me. We sat for lunch for a little while. And 
He opened his heart and said, Bishop, have you ever? God gave me a revelation. Not arrogantly. He wasn't even trying to preach to me. He even said, I, I don't even know I'm telling you about revelation. But God showed me something about the, the mountains. And I sat there. I sat there and he said, what do you think about it? And I shared my little ideas. But then he said, he said a couple other things. And I went back and I said, thank you to God. I, I spoke to him. I said, thank you, O Lord, that there are men in your kingdom who you are speaking to. That you are saying things to men. Because sometimes, let me tell you something. Sometimes I think that uh, I heard it all. But there are men who are hearing fresh things about the mountain of God and the kingdom of God. And I said, thank you, God, that you are speaking to men about your kingdom in dimensions that we have not heard. It. Thank you, oh God. He fed me. I went home and I, before I, I, I fell asleep on the couch. But, but the, the last thing I remember falling asleep was is that I was in my mind. I started to run over some of the things he said. And I started, it started clicking because, see, iron sharpens iron. Deep calls to deep. And there's some things he ignited in me. And so God started to show me things I'd never heard before because this man had an apostolic anointing to pioneer and to declare something that is not popular and to take scriptures we preach for years, but now God's given him a different idea and vision about it. You understand it? You understand it? This is what we have these men around us. God forbid on a Sunday he has to change the message because we don't know how to be faithful to the things of God. God only trusts us with what we're capable of hearing. Amen. Those of you that call this man apostle, you are blessed and favored by the Lord. I'm not, I, 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 can't, I can't do these things that, that we used to do. I can't, I'm so free. I can't beg people for money. I can't beg people for offerings. This is registered. But tomorrow, we didn't even raise an offering last night. We barely, all I know is you know, tomorrow is my last day here. I don't know what God's going to tell you to do. I don't know how bad you need what God's saying. I don't know what God's speaking to you. I just know that whenever I have been in the presence of God and God has convicted me, I could not give enough. I could not write a big enough check. I didn't, I, I couldn't, it cost me everything. There were times I couldn't pay bills because I had to, I had to sow something in the presence of God that was so overwhelming because I was so indebted to him. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand why people have to manipulate us to give and promise us cars and homes, stupid stuff like that. I tell him, God, I'm in your presence and it is your presence alone. It is truth. Whatever the Holy Spirit will speak to you to give, I don't know. I've had people write checks that didn't get no prophecies, but they heard one tape. A guy who's a, a Dallas cowboy who heard just my tapes, not even me, in person. And one day I open an envelope, it's $25,000. So what is this from? He says, man, I just heard two tapes. I'll never be the same from two tapes. God spoke to him. God's going to speak like that to us. God wants to speak. I don't know what God's going to tell you to give. I don't know what it is, but our giving has nothing to do with God. We don't give to move God. We give because we need to give. We give because our, what's in our hand is a sign of what's in our life. What we bring to the altar is a prophecy of how we live. God commanded them to raise a sheep in their house for Passover. Become emotionally attached to it. The sheep was supposed to become a part of the family. So then on Pesach, when they would sacrifice the sheep, the children would cry because they were attached to it. They would feel the pain of loving something and knowing that it may lose its life because they themselves would have to live a sacrifice life if the gospel is going to go further. When you give offerings, you don't give offerings to pay budgets. You don't give offerings to pay bills. Many of us have given money that we will never, ever be honored for because we gave it in the wrong spirit. We gave because we were in a building fund. We gave because of those. That we didn't give because what was in our hand was a sign of what's in our life. And when what's in your hand becomes a prophetic symbol of what's in your life, it will depart from your hand but will not depart from your life. And what you sow in the kingdom may be absent from your account but not absent from your resources do you understand that I have seen God move with no money with no money I have seen God do supernatural things that have blown my mind and when I was in the when I was homeless in the street in I'm gonna tell you how God moves for years 
I was saved on March 28th. That's the day I got saved. And every year, on March 28th, since I have been saved, I go to Walmart or Kmart and I buy hundreds of blankets and medical packets and things. And I go to the homeless just by myself. Every year I do. Nobody goes with me, nothing. I've done it secretly for you. And I might, the day that God brought me into the kingdom, I celebrate my spiritual birth by getting around people and going through the, to the areas that sometimes when we are successful in ministry, we don't have the time to do. And I go and I give the blankets and the pillows to the homeless people. And I spend that entire day telling God, oh, this could have been me. Little did I know, little did I know, that one day I would be homeless in a park. Saved, sanctified, filled, homeless with nothing. And while I was sitting on a bench crying, saying, God, how did I get how did I get here? A homeless man comes up with a brand new blanket. He was cold, you know, and says, Hey buddy, how you doing? You know, and I'm like, man, it's hard. He says, You telling me? I've been living in this park for two years. Wife left me, my, took my kids, everything. My world fell apart this way. He said, they just gave me a blanket, but you know, he says, I know how to work the system. So I got in line a second time, <laughs> changed my hat, and they gave me another blanket. I was going to try to make some money with it, but you out here. And he gave me a blanket, and it was so overwhelming. It was so overwhelming because I understood the resources of God. And I saw something come back into my hand that had no great worth. It was not a Mercedes or a private jet, but it spoke volumes. God spoke to me. Do you understand that God was telling me, Ferran, I remember your blankets. And if I remember your blankets, everything the devil stole, I'm going to give it back to you. Can I speak to you? That homeless man was a prophet of God and didn't even know it. He didn't know that the blanket was a prophecy that encouraged me. Sometimes we're so religious we can't hear God speaking all around us. We don't know he's speaking all the time through people. Balaam was called a prophet. Balaam. And yet he never converted. Never was a convert. And was a prophet of a false god but he was referred to as a prophet later why because one time in his life the lord spoke through him that's all it takes you understand one time god is speaking to us all the time sometimes through people that aren't saved i have i have at times heard sounds and songs and music and things that Traditionally, I would not allow to enter into my spirit, but God, I'd be in a mall and they'd be playing something and I'd listen to it. And I said, oh, I hear you, I hear, I hear you speaking. I hear you speaking through a dying generation that is so confused that they esteem bling bling. And women have sold themselves for apple and bottom jeans. And I hear the cry of a desperate world. And I weep because our young people let these things in their spirit because they're so desperate to be loved they will be defined by the shape of their behind and not their intelligence and genius and passion it moves me to prayer it moves me to conviction it moves me to pray for generations that I got it man I got God's given me the word I mean there are people people that God has let me come into the presence of God people that you wouldn't even some of you would never be allowed to speak to because you're too holy too deep you couldn't relate to them I've been in the presence of men great rappers great musicians people that are fam famous and, and I knew I, I was able to relate to them and they that's what what confused them is that this bishop knows a little bit about us and relates to us. I wasn't condemning I wasn't beating them up I wasn't sitting there or anything I just spoke to their spirit. I spoke to their destiny. I didn't even I didn't even try to get them saved. There are men that I sat at the table with, and I said, "You know, you know better." And they looked at me, "What do you mean?" I said, "I said, well, 
I'm not even gonna tell you the guy's name, but I had an opportunity down in Southern Florida where I was living. I moved there right before all of this stuff fell apart, man. I had an opportunity to meet with somebody. We were sitting at dinner at the Ritz Carlton. And here in comes this guy, and he knows one of the people that's sitting at the table because they are one of the biggest producers, but his father is a pastor, Rodney Jurgens, who is a dark child, a producer, Beyonce, and all the people. And he's sitting there, he's having dinner with me because I just preached for his dad, and his dad said, he's in Miami, why don't you just, you know, take him out. And he says, hey, come on. So go on, and this, this rapper comes across the room, and he says, hey, Rodney, what's up, man? He sit there and says, hey, this is Bishop Ash, he's a friend, he just preaches, hey, Bishop, you want them pimp bishops like the rest of them? You know, that's, that's all they know, you know, driving big cars and fancy stuff. And I said, I said, I don't, I said, I don't know. I don't know, but I know this much. I know that you're not like the rest of the rappers. That this is not what your first call was. He says, what do you mean? He says, man, I'm doing what I do. I'm paying my bills. That's all it's about. Said, but it's not always been about that. And I began to speak the word of the Lord to him. Just chill. And then when I was finished, I just turned my back. Didn't even say goodbye. I told him, I said, this, 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 and this. I said, you did this, this, this went wrong. And you trusted this person, they let you down. You saw hypocrisy because there was a man of God that you had great favor in as a young person. And all you saw was money and things. And you got caught up in all of that stuff and realized that it was not about God. It was about those things. And so you said, forget it. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it this way. And since then, you have lived an empty life. You go from girl to girl, from relationship to relationship. You've been betrayed by two or three people, all of these things. I said, you are empty. You are filled. You have gold and cars and homes that you will never live in and enjoy. Because every day you are empty, an endless vacuum who contemplates suicide. And you drown yourself in drugs and alcohol because you're trying to get rid of the pain of the call of God that you are ignoring. And I turned my back and said, now, go home. I don't have another thing to say to you. And I turned my back and I told Rodney, I said, man, I'm gonna leave. I'm through with this. And I walked out and left him there. Rodney called me and Rodney said, this guy cussed you out. He said, who the eh, who does he think he is? Talk to me like that and walk out of that room like that. Rodney says, and Rodney looked at him and said, man, I know your story. You hear cussing and God just read your book. Do you know how many people that God speaks the truth to and we still try to play it off? Right? You hear, I can, I, you, and this is the thing, man. And that guy sat down at the table, man. And a week later, he called Rodney and says, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to begin. I don't know what to, what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. I just know that everything that he said is God. But I am too deeply, what do I do? Do I stop? Do I lose it all? You know? I just bought my mom, my mom a house. She lived in an apartment. All, it's the first time, you know? Does, do I lose it? What do I do? Do you understand that there are people that are being called to challenge it? God is speaking to us in so many. And the word of the Lord came to him, and it came quick, and it came sharp. And it came with me sitting at a table to influence him, not even knowing that several months later I would be going through my own trial with this guy. And the funny thing is, when everything was lost, I lost when we found out that I, all this money was being embezzled and things, he wanted he told Rodney I, I want to do something for him and he wanted to give me a check and God spoke to me and it a check from these guys you these guys write checks like you you know like you give quarters in the church I mean it's <laughs> they write a check and when they get through writing it there's not enough space in the little box they give them to put zeros to put it in to write it all the way across serious I'm not lying and I told Ronnie, he says, this man, he wants to do something for you. I said, the Lord, because this man saw abuse in ministry, God will not allow me to receive from their hand any money. Now, you don't understand. Everything in me 
said go get your money but this man needed to see somebody anybody that was in this for God and I desperately needed it desperately needed it and if nothing I don't know you know he's still rapping he's still, if his life has never changed he will never be able to stand before God and say that he did not experience a real man of, he did not see it he could say I, but, but, but I saw hypocrites but God said I sent one yeah. one who your money would have changed his, but sa almost saved his life and he stood for what's right that's what we do it doesn't make sense it, it, it's foolish it, it contradicts everything and yet there are seasons that I will be in a service and there'll be a woman there who has nothing and gets a welfare check and God says give it all and I take it and don't even blink because her future is dependent on her breaking the spirit of poverty off her life it doesn't make sense I don't understand it I just know that at the end of the day it's not about titles and positions it's not people saying Bishop Ash was a great preacher it was people saying I saw a man who wanted to be like Jesus it so impressed me that I wanted to be like Jesus that's all I want to hear all I want to hear is people in the kingdom at the end of this world at the end of these ages in the presence of their maker saying all I wanted was to be like you do you know the greatest psychological disposition we have we have traced psychologically that most psychological dispositions problems bipolar syndrome schizophrenia uh, paranoia um, uh, clinical depression all of these things are the direct we have traced this now we have traced this are the direct result of children's view of their parents perception of them our psychological disposition is determined most of the time by the dynamics of our relationship with our progenitors and some of us got some messed up stuff and so God offers us the healing for that the healing for that is a father who perfectly loves you and you can never let down who so completely loves you that there is nothing you can do any more or any less that will make him love you any more or any less you understand that you are perfectly loved by him now you can't be any more righteous and he won't love you anymore you can't backslide and he won't love you any less he will love you wherever you are as perfectly and completely it is that knowledge that heals us and makes us healthy and touches another generation to say we ain't calling you to this because we want you just to be saved we want you to be better we want you to be healed we want you to find out what true love agape unconditional love is amen God's gonna challenge you this week and I'm finished I want you to go home and contemplate these things the Bereans said these words they said when they heard the apostles preach they said let us go search the scriptures and see if these things that they have said truly be of God and if they be of God we will follow them and if not we will leave these things alone let us all be like the Bereans let us go back tonight and let's speak to the author of the book and say you wrote it is what he's saying is are the things that he is saying are they truth and if they are truth let us be accountable let's not only be accountable for truth but let us be procurers of truth let me tell you about truth I opened up saying that truth is so absolute you must come to it let me tell you what the Bible says about truth the Bible says buy the truth and sell it not truth is so valuable that in order for my truth to become your truth it can't become your you can hear it and not own it you can hear truth and not own it it is when you hear it and you say that's mine and what's going to give me a right to it is not that I'm going to repeat it it's that I'm going to sow into it and my sowing says I value it so much that now the things that have transformed your life will transform mine so that I can without any conviction say that these things that I'm living by are not Bishop Ash's truth they're mine I have paid for it I have bought it I have bought the truth 
and I'm not selling. I'm not selling truth. I'm just declaring it. But if there is any value in it, you will not allow God to be diminished by another man's revelation. But you will take ownership in it for yourself. Amen? That's all I know. That's all I know. That's all I know about the kingdom. That's all I know about the things that have ministered to me. I feel a spirit of hungry people here. Uh, Bishop, I, I, I just met him last night. I met him and I, I walked in and last night I talked to him.